Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host, and this week, Adam is on vacation, so I have a guest host with me, Wesley Stray, who's going to be joining me in talking about physical security. Thanks for having me, Andy. Thanks for being here. Physical security is one of those subdomains of information security that a lot of us don't have expertise in. It is literally an entire career field that people can get into, but oftentimes in the information security field, especially in a smaller company, we get tasked because physical security involves a lot of times network controls these days, access controls, cameras that involved IP cameras and network protocols. So a lot of times in smaller companies, we get tasked for physical security on top of information security. Wesley here is the supervisor for our physical security or corporate security at our company. And I brought him on because our physical security program is very, very good. I know Wesley was involved in building that program pretty much from the start. So Wesley, if you can just give an introduction about yourself, kind of let our listeners know your experience and uh, what you're doing today. Absolutely. So I've been in the uh, security industry for a little less than 15 years now. Uh, started in law enforcement and moved into a career in investigations. And after that, I found my way into uh, corporate security. Um, been in corporate security for about eight years now um, with uh, a current employer for a little over two. And uh, it's been it's been a, a ride. Um, there's been a lot of development within the industry in, in just that short period of time. Um, I have most of my experience comes from uh, the IT uh, field. Uh, I should say IT portions of physical security. Um, there's a there's a lot to be said about org charts with physical security, and that kind of determines the level of experience that you're going to get with the particular types of uh, physical security programs. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be part of an IT team that had uh, the physical security reported up to IT, and so I spent a lot of time really focusing on. Uh, you know, IP cameras, access control systems, intrusion detection, the, the more techie sides of, uh, of physical security. And that's what brought me over to uh, my current role. So physical security is often like the first layer of protection in any organization, right? When you, when you approach an organization from a physical site, when you walk in, that's the, typically the first thing that happens is, seeing what kind of physical security there is. Are there cameras? Are there um, you know, timed locks on the doors? Any type of badging system in place? Maybe even a receptionist, you know, that, that first layer person who's greeting you or can you just walk right into the work area? So it's, it's pretty important, uh, especially from an information security standpoint, when you're trying to prevent people from accessing like the physical servers or systems that are on site. I like to refer back to one of my favorite movies, Star Wars Rogue One, yeah. because in that movie, they're trying to steal the plans to the Death Star, right? That's like proprietary information that is that is very sensitive to the Empire. And what do they have to do? They have to go on site and break into a facility, you know, do um, some espionage, some cover uh, and then break into the physical security to steal the plant, and then they beamed it out, you know, using uh, network communications, right, to to the space shuttle, uh, the space station that was uh, waiting outside. So um, that's kind of a perfect example of information security. And not only that, too, in that movie, which is uh, also something that we worry about, is there was an insider threat. You know, the Yes. Uh, person who designed the Death Star actually designed a vulnerability within the Death Star, so it was an insider threat, and then um, that was something that was exploited later on once they got their information um, in the hands of the rebels. So 
I like to use that example because I'm a huge Star Wars fan, uh, but that's why physical security is important. So when you look at physical security, Wesley, what are some recommendations if it's just an organization starting out, especially the folks who are in smaller companies, maybe they might not have a physical security program sure. or they are information security practitioners and they're tasked with getting some kind of program together. Where do you recommend that people start? That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I really like to say that a, a balanced approach to physical security is a great balance between uh, compliance regulations and industry best practices. The industry best practices are there. You can have a lot of them, uh, but they don't always fit every organization, uh, whether it's, you know, corporate culture, whether it's, uh, you know, infrastructure, whether, it, I mean, there's, there's all a myriad of challenges that you can face. And finding somewhere in there is a good balance. And really what that starts with is a risk assessment. And the risk assessment is, is really going to be an honest, frank conversation with your organization's leadership as to what, what their risk tolerances are, what they define to be important to the organization, and really what they're willing to, um, willing to commit to make sure that there are, there are physical protections surrounding those assets. Yeah, that's a really good way to frame it because we talk about risk assessment all the time when it comes to accepting risk for information security. So that's that's a great place to start for folks. Um, and that may differ, you know, based on a lot of different things, right? How much money you have to commit, um, what area you live in, like the likelihood of something happening, right? Um do you recommend if you're tasked with physical security to maybe reach out to the local police departments to see like crime rates and, and whatnot in the area, like establish a relationship with the local police? Yes. Uh, local law enforcement is pretty paramount in establishing a really good physical security plan. Um, and the, the great thing about that relationship is it can expand so far beyond just simple crime statistics. Uh, you can you can develop that relationship, do walkthroughs with response teams, uh, get their input on on policy, on you know a, a whole number of things, so that if you are tasked with that emergency situation or that does that does happen, you already have that relationship. You have responding officers who are familiar with your facility, with your culture, with your response procedures, and it really makes for a, a much cleaner. A response uh, and and provides better protection for both your assets and you know we always like to say in in physical security no matter what your risk assessment is your most valuable asset is always the people no matter no matter what your leadership defines as the most valuable assets people are always a number one at the top of that list so creating that that uh, that bond. Uh, with your local law enforcement can can help you determine that that likelihood uh, as well as the the opportunity that you have uh, to provide protection. When you're doing a risk assessment, let's say an organization doesn't have a lot of money or they're not willing to commit a lot of resources to it, they want maybe like the bare minimum or maybe they don't want to hire specific people to say patrol or or enforce things right mm -hmm. where would you say the bare minimum is kind of for that employee safety um, if i'm and if i have nothing right now where is the bare minimum that as a physical security person you would recommend to start Whew. well that's a really good question i'm probably going to repeat that a couple of times uh, <laughs> But uh, from starting from absolute scratch, really the best thing you can, you can do for your organization, there's a, a really great theory when it comes to physical security that's called the broken windows theory. And what's that, what that is about is it's about showing that you are caring for your building, for your grounds, for your organization. So 
to really start, you can actually deter a lot of physical security um, incidents just by working with your facilities team to say, hey, I want to make sure that my doors lock on the on the exterior. I want to make sure everything's clean. I want to make sure the lawn is taken care of, the trees are taken care of, there's no trash around. I mean, these are already standard building maintenance things that uh, you know are part of the company's budget, but they go a long way towards making your organization not appear to be a target because it looks like somebody is taking care of it and somebody cares about it, giving the impression that somebody is watching and protecting it as well. That's probably the A number one thing that I would start with. Man, that's such good advice. I've never heard that theory before, and I think for a lot of folks listening to this show, if you don't have a physical security program, I mean, that is something that – great advice, right? Just just take care of your building, which is something that you're probably already doing. Um, but, yeah, not, not appearing as a threat. That's, that's such good advice. So um, once you get that in place, if you get some money to invest, right, there's a lot of – controls that you can put in place so what are some controls that once you get some money and people are willing to um, try to mitigate some of these risks as part of that risk assessment that you've uh, done already where do you recommend investing money uh, to start with and then kind of building that program going out starting with access control uh, that's that's definitely your number one whether whether it be key cards physical keys um, having a an auditable system that shows who has access to your facilities is, is really going to be the best thing towards making sure your staff are safe and making sure that you're meeting the bare minimum to any compliance requirements that you might have for your organization. Yeah, that's really good. Uh, when I was at another company and we were starting from scratch, you know, the first thing that we did was put in access controls, key cards to get into the building and we also put cameras in front of those doors, not not throughout the facility, maybe in front of some of the, the key areas. But when we got those camera systems, we didn't buy a ton. We didn't have enough money to buy enough for every single place, nook and cranny in the buildings. But what we did was put them in right in front of the entrances, right? So you can right. correlate when you someone badges in and someone walks in, hopefully, right? Yes. Um, and, and again, that, that comes down to that risk assessment where, you know, it's you're talking about uh, what are those critical areas? What are those the high traffic areas, the areas that you're going to get all of your traffic? Um, there's there's a, a large portion, again, that, you know, I've talked a lot about physical security. And, and really, we think of the first layer of defense being at the exterior of the building. And I always like to talk about extending that curtain extending, you know, thinking about, um, you know, when you're looking at your, your network security, there's layers to that. And it's the same thing with physical security, that there are layers to your perimeter. And it starts all the way at the border of your property. And there's, there's so many things that you can do, whether it's fences, or just, again, going back to, uh, you know, shrubbery, things like that. Um, but those pathways funnel all of your your visitor traffic, your employee traffic to those high visibility areas. Uh, there's a, a theory called prime, prime prevention through environmental design, uh, SEPTED, and it's it's about really getting people to unconsciously go to those high visibility areas, and it makes the people who belong there. It makes the people who are invited, our employees, whatever, it makes them feel safe. And it makes all of the people who are bad actors and the people who know they shouldn't be there feel uncomfortable because it makes them visible. Mm-hmm. So that's, you know, again, going back to that, to that risk assessment, those are the areas that are most important to provide that visibility because you're going to notice that, that unusual behavior in, in those areas because the, the facility is designed to make them feel uncomfortable as they approach. I like that. Speaking of visitors, you know, one of the policies at our company is you have to be escorted. You have to have a sponsor. You have to sign in. Why do you think that that is an important thing if uh, versus a company where you can just kind of stroll in, 
you know, if, if you're visiting, you just kind of go right to the, the employee that you know uh, versus kind of having those policies in place. Because some, some people may think that that's burdensome, right? Like, mm -hmm. I have a visitor. I just want them to come in. It's my family. I know them, you know, instead of having to call you up, go to the front desk and, and sign in and all that other stuff, right? Right. So uh, there's, there's the – you mentioned before the great example of physical media. You know, physical media is, is always a problem. Uh, but that even comes down to uh, cell phones, somebody having a, a cell phone with a camera in it in your facility and doing some doing some good old fashioned shoulder surfing. And there there is always the possibility that somebody who is a guest there is going to run into proprietary information, whether it be a, a client's information or critical business information. Or they could simply just wander into a place that they're simply not supposed to be uh, and could you know, potentially hurt, hopefully, uh, not some critical infrastructure, but there is, there is always that possibility again, depending on the, the controls that are put in place to, to prevent them from getting there. So, uh, you know, escort procedures or having, having some manner of controlling visitor access is not something that people think about from that perspective. Uh, you know, we want to be as welcoming as possible, especially when you're in a customer service field. It really makes a uh, it's a it's an interesting contrast to think about welcoming visitors, but at the same time, making sure that you're you're providing that intangible barrier uh, between them and your your proprietary information. And maybe there's a compliance policy out there that requires an audit log of visitors, right? Yes, I mean, oftentimes if you're that's tracking the case. that, yeah. 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 So, I, and you mentioned kind of shoulder surfing. Another one of my favorite movies. You know why? When I think back to what got me into information security, is Hackers, right? Oh yeah. Um, if you if you've seen that movie, uh, when they have to when they have to harass the FBI agent in the movie, um, this guy they send him in to shoulder surf and memorize all the passwords that he's seeing as he's you know kind of delivering flowers. And obviously, that company at the time didn't have an escort. Um, policy in place so he just walked in with his delivery flowers and he's looking at everyone's keyboards and and papers and stuff like that and um you know as well as another example in that movie if you're looking at disposing of information right I, a lot of places still have paper and if you're tossing out paper you want to have like those shred bins i know that our company right. we, we do have those right right so have a shred bin and uh if it's Digital media, you probably want to, you know, drill a hole or do something to destroy it because they did a lot of dumpster diving in that movie. Yeah, and people still do that, right? It, like people if, definitely do that. That's yeah. that's a big so, part of it, uh, and I think that works both ways. When you you talk about you know an intruder that's coming in and doing some shoulder surfing and what they're trying to steal in in that respect, but at the same time, what are they trying to leave behind when they're in there? Uh, from a physical security perspective, one of the one of the things that people tend to forget is if there is a breach of the building. Uh, to you know, how many physical security departments are calling up their IT team to say, "Hey, somebody was in here that we don't know about. We need an IT asset audit, and we need to sweep. We need people to sweep for malicious devices." Yep. Because so, so few people think, or many people, I should say. Uh, think that the uh, the intruder is simply looking to walk out with something, not looking to leave something behind, and, and that's yeah. that's another avenue there. Yeah, great example. Just like when I was thinking back to the Capitol riots, when there was the breach of the Capitol, right? You know, all the IT assets were exposed. Right? Who knows if they planted something or if they took something? You know, um, there should there should definitely be an IT audit afterwards uh, when there's a physical security breach it's interesting because physical security you know once you start getting into like breaches like that or emergency situations sometimes that for physical security kind of goes into maybe uh, facilities management if you don't have a physical security i remember at my old company we were tasked with the access controls and the IP cameras, but then when it came to an incident response plan of a physical disaster 
or a fire, let's say a fire, right? Or a tornado or something like that, which is a threat to IT systems if you house, you know, data there. Just having your workstations there really is, it could be a, a information security incident. But when you start getting into those type of, you know, physical threats, then it kind of, it, it can be almost a balance between the facilities people who probably hold that plan um, or hopefully like a team like yours, right? Because you, you guys handle that sort of stuff at our company, right? Much of it, yes. Uh, and it's a, it's a great balance. And we talked a little bit about org charts from the very beginning. And it's really common. I think the, most, the two most common uh, org charts that I've seen with security is for them to file up to IT or them to uh, filter up to facilities. Facilities probably being the most common. And it's facilities tends to operate fire alarms uh, and environmental detections for flood, moisture, you know, anything like that, uh, power outages, whatever. Um, but one of the things that, you know, physical security program does is it's inspecting those doors. We, you know, we talked about just caring for your facility. Uh, there's a great movie out there uh, with Sylvester Stallone called Escape Plan. Where he is, uh, he's in a, a prison escape consultant, and right away he breaks out of a cell uh, by jamming some uh, uh, toilet paper, some wet toilet paper, in, into the trap, so that the uh, officer, you know, doesn't think to to pull pull the trap and, and see that the latch hasn't actually secured, and that's one of the one of the best ways for. Uh, an actual physical security breach, and and you know when I when I use the term breach, I'm not uh, thinking of you know a big you know smash and grab, uh, but it it is you know anything that that is a uninvited person or un you know um, unwanted guest, if you will, uh, that's that's right. defeating your your layers of access control, and that always leads to or starts with little probes whether to see if somebody's watching or see if they can, you know, create a, an easier avenue for entrance later. And that's where you're, you can leverage your facilities team again to do inspections on your doors, so your windows, your latches, uh, all of those things. If you, if you don't have the money for, for somebody to go out and do physical security building checks, uh, you can really leverage uh, a lot of the internal departments that you have to, to make sure all of that stuff is taken care of. And no one's able to to manipulate it that way. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned humidity and environmental controls. I mean, that's especially if you're housing, um, you know, servers on site. Uh, there are still people who do. You know, th there's been kind of almost a uh, a return back to housing your own data because of uh, privacy issues and all of that, and and um, trying to rely less and less on the cloud mm -hmm. but i mean when i was in the military and i deployed to afghanistan when i got there that like day one um we were in a civil engineering squadron and we were told that there was an emergency because the building that housed all the servers had kind of you know been built from a closet basically like through time right. right and it was not built like a server room was supposed to be built with uh, proper HVAC and hot rows and, and cooling rows and stuff like that. It was literally like a closet that they converted into a server room and it I was think, overheating <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, like through, through time they just added more and more servers. So it was overheating. And that was like literally the communications for all of Afghanistan. Yeah. And if we were to go down, <laughs> you know, that's, that's it for all it systems. You're, you're going back to like, you know, uh, horseback and, and delivering mail. Right. I, so. I think I've done uh, more than a dozen site assessments of buildings where I've walked in and all of a sudden you you walk past a room and you don't even need to look into it <laughs> when you see the door propped open with a box fan in front of it. And it's, oh, there's the server room. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. And like, I mean, propping open a, a door to your server room, right? Like that's that's probably the worst thing that you can do. 
Um, you know, I think even for uh, for any organization, if you have access controls, I think a lot of times you're not even thinking about who needs actual access to the the server room, right? It's like all, all IT gets access, right? It's kind of like when it comes to credentials and you need like the, you know, super admin credentials. I, I'll just give it to you because it's easy. Um, you know, I don't want to have to deal with any pushback. So uh, same thing with IT, or, you know, for server rooms. If you're in IT, okay, yeah, we'll just give you access to it. We don't think about if you actually need access to it, right? Right. Um, and that can kind of crawl as, you know, that's a that's a risk because if they lose their badge and now, you know, you have someone who has access to data systems. And worse is like what you're saying, you know, you walk by the room and it's just propped open yeah. because of poor ventilation. Yeah. So, and that's a, that's a huge information security risk, right? Right. And... You know, beyond that, there's there's those external threats. If you're using a, an electronic access control system, depending on the encryption that you're using or the, the type of credential that you're using, mm-hmm. it's it's so easy to skim credentials and, and copy them. Uh, you know, it's it's I, we love to talk about uh, very sophisticated attack methodologies, and it, I think a lot it escapes a lot of people how simple that process is. Uh, to to skim and clone uh, an access control card. Yeah, that's a great call out. You know, I think on our network and even when I stood this up previously, you have those on segregated networks, right? right? They're like, they're, you're not putting those on your main network. It, right. Like you're literally firewalling it off so that is, it's on its own. That way, if your main network gets compromised, hopefully not, but if it does, you're not able to access the the same information and and you you mentioned that i think there are different protocols for access controls right like you you could encrypt but sometimes they're not encrypted right or are they like in the clear yeah yeah and it 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 really depends on uh again i I think we we talked a, a a lot and we've kind of beat the dead horse on risk assessment uh but you know it it's crazy how much stems from that and goes down goes to how much you're you're willing to uh, spend uh, for that, and thinking about uh, multi-factor or dual-factor authentication to enter critical infrastructure or you know specific spaces where uh, high high-level information is being stored, uh, whether on physical media or or you know getting to your to your servers or or whatever. Um, you start you start talking about uh, that badge that can easily be skimmed uh, or uh, provided through a little bit of social engineering mm-hmm. uh, to to somebody that shouldn't necessarily be there, but then you add that that second layer of a pin code or a fingerprint scan or anything like that that suddenly kind of stops that short. Yeah. It's, you, you, it's interesting you mentioned social engineering because a lot of pen tests when as a security team you're you're conducting an external pen test or a third party pen test there are a lot of companies that will actually ask if they want to do a physical pen test as part of an information security pen test or a social engineering pen test and i remember at my old company we were a little bit scared of that because we knew it, we would probably fail, right? We knew the, the the mitigations that we had in place were probably not good enough to survive a physical uh, pen test, right? Um, and so one thing that's that's important to call out for physical pen tests is physical pen tests are, and I don't want to leave the impression that physical security controls are useless. But when you're dealing with very sophisticated people who design systems for a living, they're going to be much more likely to be successful in in getting in, whether they actually get to the uh, the critical infrastructure or the, the designated targets for the pen test. Uh, they're they're going to breach some layer uh, of your of your physical security controls. And it's important to view those as learning opportunities and that there's always something that you can tighten up, whether it be from a process or a technology standpoint uh, or even a training standpoint. There is always something that you can learn from those pen tests in order to you know, increase your security posture. 
Yeah. So, you know, we've talked about kind of the smaller companies uh, and maybe for the larger companies that might have a lot of money and maybe they haven't gone down the route of looking at a good physical security program. I, I kind of want to give them a really good idea of what we do because our physical security at our company is, I think, one of the best that I've ever seen. Uh, I'll give you an example. We were talking about this before the show, but today I had to go on site in a long time to actually get my COVID test, and they moved the COVID testing from an outside trailer where I could just walk up to inside the building uh, on the basement level, on the ground floor, which is a floor down from the where you would enter in the building. And because I was expecting it to be outside, I didn't bring my badge. And then I, I called them and I was like, hey, this, this trailer's empty. Uh, and they're like, oh, yeah, come into the building. And so, you know, we have this procedure where we can actually push a button and call into the corporate security office and they answer and they, they see you on the camera and, you know, right at the door. And um, I was like, hey, I need, I need to come in for my COVID test. And they're like, yeah, sure, okay. So they actually let me into the building. They, they checked my name and everything and, and made sure I was an employee and um, they let me into the building. But then they didn't realize that it was down a floor. So I'm wandering around because you can't get into the stairwell without your badge. You can't um, get go down the elevator without your badge. And in that area that I was led into, to, I was like, oh, I'll just walk to the corporate security office and let them know I couldn't even get out of that area without a badge. So uh, I was pretty much locked down. <laughs> and I had to go back and, and ask again. I'm like, hey, I, I actually need to go down in the stairwell. And then they, they pushed a button and actually unlocked the door, which was actually really cool. So um, so when you get uh, you know to the point of having some mo- some really um, good amount of money to invest, you know, like uh, camera systems and access security with you know, um, encryption. But I, what about the one thing that we have, you know, to kind of talk about that where it kind of prevents people from um, piggybacking, right, uh, or tailgating off yes. each other. That, that's a huge issue where, you know, I'll, I'll scan my badge and then someone else will just keep the door open, right, and just let a bunch of people in off of the one badge. Like, how do you solve that? There's, I would say two things. And and one of the things that is a, a often overlooked uh, process as far as physical security controls is in a, in a lot of ways, we like to jump to a mechanical solution, right? I always like to, to use the, the terminology of mechanical solutions to solve people problems. And <laughs> there's, there's two ways that, that this can be done. And one is through corporate culture. And that is, it takes a lot uh, to develop a, a corporate security culture where piggybacking or you know tailgating whichever term you want to use is highly frowned upon and it really needs to come from from leadership down and that and there can be very few exceptions to that Uh, but Mm -hmm. the second is there are a number of physical controls that you can put in whether it be man traps uh turnstiles are always a great one uh there are um revolving doors uh you know, any number of, of physical impediments that just make it uh, very difficult for more than one person to go through any portal at a, a given time. Uh, down to, you know, uh, line cross analytics on a camera. If you're, if you're buying a camera for uh, an IP camera just to watch your entrance, there's a lot of uh, great edge analytics that are out there now that you're already paying for when you when you purchase the camera, and you can set up some simple scripting on the on the camera to set off an alert, send notification, you know, whatever for response uh, to let you know, hey, more than one person came through this door with only one credential. Hmm. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I like how you said that. People like to jump to mechanical controls, and then there's a difference between uh, a physical control and a culture or a policy. And that's the same thing in information security, right? I, I love there's parallels between you know how information security and physical security work because it's the same thing. You can put a corporate policy in place and say, you know, you're not supposed to put any of your data on a non 
corporate machine, right? Or you could also put a technical control and, and block it, right? They try to download something on a non-corporate machine and it gets blocked. So two different ways to think about it. You don't always have to have a tool in place. You can have a policy and build that culture. And that's uh, something I think our company has done really well, like through the time. I remember just getting there and uh, there was uh, the old entrance and when you walked in, you would badge. And then literally, like, as you're going through the door, you're shutting the door behind you, even if there's a line, right? And everyone's badging, going through, shutting the door behind you. Like, it, you might think it's rude at first, but it's, you know, part of that culture where everyone has to badge in, right? I think it was even frowned upon where you would badge the door while it was open. Like, you badge through, you open the door, and I badge and walk in without closing the door, right? Right. Even though I think it is caught and audited, but even that was, like, frowned upon. We used to do that in my old company. We just, like, badge, like, okay, it's going to get caught. We're walking through. We're not going to close the door. But, yeah, there was that culture built in where people were just shutting the door on each other. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's a that's a great call out. Yeah, it definitely takes, it definitely takes a lot of trouble. Um, and I think we've talked before about low-cost solutions. And policy and process controls are probably the most underrated part of physical security and usually are kind of that a jumping off point from when you have some physical security duties that are designated to a person or, uh, you know, somebody on a department and the creation of a unique physical security role or team. As it comes down to the administration of all of those those corporate policies and those those low cost options that do a lot towards increasing your physical security posture. Yeah, yeah. and if you have, like for our company, we we actually have you know corporate security partners who um, have patrol cars and they they man you know uh, basically post throughout the day, right? where they're stationed somewhere and, and then they do yeah. kind of patrols. If you don't have the money for that, uh, have you been um, floated the idea or even augmenting our staff with say like a, uh, a contracted um, you know, company to, to just do site checks? I mean, that's something I've seen in the past. I don't know if what you've seen in, in that aspect or recommend for yes. companies who may not have the money to staff like full-time staff, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it really, again, you know, as we, as we, you know, as I like to say, it keeps going back to that risk assessment. Um, but one of the, the driving factors there is as it comes down to, you, you determine your, your risk tolerances, you determine your asset value, and then probably the, the biggest thing that determines whether or not you're going to implement, um, a, a on staff guard force or, um, you know, hire a, a contract service is what is your expectation for response? And in a lot of places, you know, the expectation for response is come when we call you and, mm -hmm. and that's sufficient. And for that contract, contract staff is wonderful. Uh, you know, a lot of times they're very underrated. Um, it's, it's important to maintain a relationship with them and, and not expect them to, to do everything. Uh, because again, you're, you're, bringing people into your organization and you want them to understand what your uh, company is about, right? And what's important to you so, so that those patrol elements will start to provide you the information and the feedback that's important to, to your program, to your organization. Um, and then once that expectation for response uh, goes beyond come when we call you, we want shorter response times. We want somebody on, on site. We want, uh, presence, uh, you know, Andy, you're former law enforcement and, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're very well versed in the force option continuum. And the first one is being that, that physical presence. And, yep. you know, when, when that it becomes a, uh, important thing to your organization, then it's time to start evaluating either full-time contract guard staff or hiring proprietary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, those are all some great points. You know, one of the other things too, you know, we haven't talked about, I was, I've been at companies where they have an alarm system, 
right? And that's that's also an, uh, another component. If you don't have full time staff, maybe you just lock up and you set an alarm, right? And that's also offloading the risk to say a, a monitoring company yes. who will then dispatch um, a, a contracted or real police, right? Yes. Um, so that that you know goes back to your what is the expectation of response, right? If it's okay that the response time from getting tripping the alarm to uh, the dispatch of them being on site, then, you know, that's probably an acceptable risk based on the cost. So, yeah. And part of that's locality, right? Uh, mm-hmm. I've worked with organizations that have had parts, or I should say parts of the organization, whether it be, um, you know, a, a small office or a larger office that are in, in very rural areas mm-hmm. and, There's no contract guard staff that's going to be out there. And it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to staff full-time guards there. So Mm -hmm. your, your intrusion alarm goes, goes right to the local law enforcement. Yep. Um, And hopefully it's a municipal one uh, and not a County one because counties (laughs) tend to be spread thin in rural areas uh, and and response times are larger, but (laughs) there you have it. Uh, It gets full into your risk profile exactly i mean that's my old company we were located in a rural area where people left their doors unlocked still right everyone knew everyone in the town they didn't lock their car doors they didn't lock their front doors and so the risk of a physical breach was on the lower side and yeah there was no way to get uh, full-time staff out there. So yeah, we, we just had an alarm system that would go right to the local PD and, and they're right down the street. So, you know, yep. the response time was five minutes. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> Lickety split. <laughs> yep. So, yeah. Well, what other advice do you have for anyone who may be starting or even maturing their model? Like where, where do you kind of, um, get to the point where you can kind of say, I have a great program in place. I don't have to worry about too much. Like we've mitigated all these risks. Ooh. It's a, conti- you know, just like yeah, IT security, it's a continuous process of reevaluation. And I think the biggest thing that can be done is to continue to build relationships with internal partners, with leadership, uh, and, and really just talk about all of the concerns that they have, because the more you know about every layer of your organization, the more you understand what those risks are and you understand how they impact other areas. And it, it doesn't necessarily make uh, risks more glaring, but you understand the relationships and, and the fallout uh, to say, oh, I have... Uh, you know, I, this this is actually presents more of a risk to this other thing, or presents less because this this other business area can can actually just absorb some of that. Uh, so I, I think the best thing to do is continue to reevaluate uh, through through policy, through audit, through uh, and just through continuous uh, understanding of what your organization wants and what your organization does, and all of the the silos within it. Such a great answer. I mean, that's l- literally what we talk about all the time, you know, on the show is, is, uh, reevaluating the risk. And I, I think from an information security side, I'm always sitting here thinking about what can I do better and how can I plug these holes? Is there another risk that I'm trying to mitigate? Uh, I'm always trying to think about that and then building those relationships, right? We talk about this all the time on our show because, you know, just like with physical security, information security is making sure that the leadership understands the risks that they're accepting, right? Like, hey, this is a huge risk that we're not mitigating because of this. And, you know, if we don't do that, you're literally accepting it. So do you want to accept this or do you want to <laughs> <laughs> right. have me put something in place to help mitigate it, right? And so, but you have to explain it in a way that is not threatening is budgetary friendly and all this other stuff. So, um, yeah, great advice. Approach it the same way that we've kind of talked about information security because all the basis you know, comes down to relationships and communication. That's, that's a great point in, you know, especially in talks with leadership, how 
uh, people tend to to see security professionals across the board as the people who who like to say no, uh, mm-hmm. and and really what what a successful security department is is they're they're the court jesters, right? They're they're the people that are saying, "Hey, that's a great idea. Here's all the ways that it could go wrong, and I just want you to know about that before you decide to do it anyway, because I know you're gonna, and I'm right. I'm happy to support you." But I just want to know, I want you to know what you're jumping into. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Wesley, this has been a fantastic conversation. I mean, really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show and, and give your point of view on physical security because it's certainly not something that, you know, I'm an expert on. Uh, while I have a little bit of experience, you know, I think you're – you definitely have more. And, and our listeners here will appreciate your point of view, especially if they – are starting from scratch or um, they may be able to use this co- uh, conversation as maybe a risk assessment at their company, right? Take a look at what they're doing. So uh, where can our listeners find you if they have some follow-up questions or if they want to reach out to you? Uh, I, I think uh, you're on LinkedIn, right? Yes, I am LinkedIn. Uh, Wesley Stray. Um um, you know, that's, that's where you can find me. That's probably the, the best place uh, professionally to reach me for any questions or follow up that anyone might have. Great. I'll post that in the show notes as a link. So I appreciate it. And, that, and I'd love a, a, a link to the, to the episode to share on my, on my LinkedIn page. Absolutely. We'll get that for you. So thank you so much for having me, Andy. Yeah. Thanks again. That's the end of our show for this week. As always, if you have any follow-up questions, our contact information will be in the show notes. If you have any other security topics you'd like to hear about, definitely reach out to us and we'll try to find a show to talk about that. Thanks and talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.